17th century telescope, man first saw the moon at close range. Today, nearly three centuries later, we've gathered much data about the surface of the moon, its great craters and mountains. Many of these craters are named after great astronomers. Today, working with modern high power and radio telescopes and other instruments, astronomers are uncovering useful information about the moon and about the heavens beyond. Though new facts are uncovered every day, the science of astronomy is old. Astronomy today may be traced back to this man, Galileo, the father of modern observational astronomy. He was born in 1564 in the town of Pisa, Italy. Here, Galileo, as a youth, became a teacher of physical sciences. Like many Renaissance scholars, Galileo used as textbooks the scientific writings of ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle, with whom he did not agree. Aristotle, who lived and taught almost 2,000 years before Galileo, was still a widely accepted authority in science. But Galileo could not accept some of the ancient theories. For example, Aristotle's writings implied that objects of differing weights fell at speeds directly proportional to their weights. Not true, said Galileo. Though warned by fellow scientists against questioning Aristotle, Galileo set about to prove that the ancient Greeks' theory of falling bodies was wrong. There's a legend that a swinging lamp in the Cathedral of Pisa gave Galileo some new ideas about falling bodies. An even more famous legend tells of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, of how Galileo, or his students, performed an experiment to determine whether unequal weights dropped from the same height would reach the ground at different or equal periods of time. Whether the legend is true or not, we know today that such an experiment shows that heavy objects of unequal weight will, in their fall to earth, consume about the same amount of time. No matter how Galileo arrived at this conclusion, through experimentation, as some believe, or, as many scientists believe, through deductive reasoning in his study, he had challenged the respected Aristotle. It also offended the authorities of his own time professors of the University of Pisa. The faculty insisted that he stop substituting his theories for those of Aristotle. Though Galileo decided to leave Pisa, he had begun to formulate concepts which were to mark him as a profound student of mechanics. His interest in mechanics would later lead to this concept, that when bodies fall freely, the distance of their fall is proportional to the square of the time of the fall. After Galileo's time, this law of falling bodies was expressed by this formula. The distance fallen by a falling body is equal to one-half the acceleration times the time squared. Galileo discovered this law at Padua. To this city he came in 1592 to take a post at the University of Padua, a liberal university that encouraged new ideas. Among the treasures Galileo found in the university library was a book written by a former student at Padua, Nicolaus Copernicus. In this book, Copernicus had advanced the startling theory that all the planets revolved about the sun that the Sun, not the Earth, was the planetary system's life-giving center. But Galileo knew that the ancient astronomer Ptolemy and other respected traditional authorities held to another theory, that Earth was the center of the universe, that Earth had no motion of its own, 
that the planets and the sun revolved about the earth. Comparing the two, Galileo, probably by 1597, came to believe that the sun-centered theory of Copernicus was the more reasonable theory of the nature of the heavens. But there was no means of collecting evidence to prove it. The next step must wait for over a decade. About 12 years later, in 1609, Galileo began to shape the science of modern astronomy. Galileo himself described how rumour came to his ears that an optical instrument had been elaborated by the aid of which visible objects, even though far distant from the eye of the observer, were distinctly seen as if near at hand. He applied himself to discovering the means by which he might arrive at a similar instrument. He prepared a tube of lead in the ends of which he fitted two glass lenses. Galileo had constructed a telescope. Gradually he improved this design as he constructed better instruments. Instruments that were to change completely man's concept of the universe. But when Galileo turned his telescope towards the skies, it revealed to him wonders. Recalling this great moment, he said, I give infinite thanks to God, who has been pleased to make me the first observer of marvellous things. The telescope brought revelation after revelation. Observing the moon, Galileo was able to determine, with some accuracy, the height of many lunar mountains. A greater achievement was to follow. On the momentous evening of January the 7th, 1610, Galileo studied the planet Jupiter and noted that three little stars were near the planet and although he believed them to belong to the number of fixed stars, yet they made him somewhat wonder. The following night, he reported, I found a very different state of things, for there were three little stars all west of Jupiter. After continued observation of the planet, Galileo discovered a fourth star, and determined that the stars were revolving about Jupiter. These were not stars, but satellites. How great were the implications of these discoveries? Both Earth and Jupiter had satellites. The Earth was not a unique body, as Aristotle, Ptolemy and other authorities had claimed. More and more Galileo was certain that Copernicus had been correct. Shining with its own light, the Sun must indeed be the center of the system. About the Sun, all planets, including Earth, must revolve. Further telescopic observations of the sun and sun spots and the phases of the planet Venus gave Galileo more evidence to support the Copernican theory. But many scholars considered Galileo a troublemaker. Something ought to be done, they agreed. Some thought the church might prevent Galileo from defending the absurd Copernican theory. Some thought Galileo's work would destroy natural science as laid down by Aristotle. To such critics, Galileo wrote, Be grateful to the man who relieves you of errors, and do not resent it. To the theories of ancient times, My opponents like to cling because they wish their ignorance to be common to all men. I value more the discovery of a simple truth than pondering the loftiest questions without any concrete results. The power of Galileo's enemies grew stronger every day. In 1616, Galileo, during a visit to Rome, learned that certain church authorities had condemned the Copernican theory. These church authorities warned Galileo against further teaching of this theory. 
He later returned to his villa, where influential friends brought him news of the continuing controversy that his published work in astronomy was causing. In this book, for instance, Letters on Sunspots, Galileo had offered more evidence to support the Copernican theory that church authorities had warned him against. In the same year, messages arrived from friends for the disappointed Galileo. In the letters, his students asked, was it true that church authorities had requested Galileo to stop teaching the Copernican theory? It was true, but Galileo believed that the church authorities did not intend to restrict his studies completely. So he continued his scientific work even though his health was failing. But it wasn't until 16 years later, when he believed the time was right, that Galileo brought to a climax the fierce battle of ideas concerning the old and new concepts of the planetary systems. He wrote this book, published in 1632. The dialogue concerning the two major world systems brought immediate denunciation from church authorities. In 1633, Galileo was summoned to Rome. In this city, certain church authorities ordered him to await trial before the judges of the Inquisition. Galileo was ill. Friends, fearful of his health, pleaded with him to give up the Copernican theory. For reasons never quite clarified, the scholarly scientists determined to renounce the Copernican theory concerning the solar system. He was convicted of heretical opinion and still under technical arrest returned to his villa. And there his agile mind turned to the exploration of new problems as well as to the clarification of old ideas. He inquired into the nature of heat and light and he brought order into his view on mechanics. This led to the writing of his greatest work on mechanics, The Two New Sciences. And so his final eight years were among his most fruitful. To the end, this great teacher continued to open men's minds to a clearer understanding of the nature of the physical world. How shall we remember this great man of science? We can think of the youthful professor who broke with traditional authorities and whose theories gave rise to the famous law of falling bodies. Above all, we can remember Galileo as a man who fought for the right of science to question tradition. The man who challenged the old to make way for the new. The man who proclaimed, science must be free. Mm -hmm.